Welcome to today's presentation, The Future IT Workplace. My name is Sarah McChesney, and on behalf of ProTech Training, I will serve as your host for today. This presentation will last approximately 45 minutes, with additional time reserved at the end for Q&A. During the webinar, please feel free to enter any of your questions into the question area, which may be found within the control panel in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Our presenter will be happy to answer them at the end of the session. Today's presentation is being recorded, and in the coming days, you will receive an email containing the recording link. Now some information about our guest speaker. Eric Bloom is the Executive Director of the IT Management and Leadership Institute. He is also an Amazon best-selling author, speaker, trainer, and an, and an executive coach. He has over a decade of experience training students virtually around the globe. Eric is also a formerly nationally syndicated columnist, TEDx speaker, and a recognized thought leader on the use of influence within the workplace. Eric was also a past president of National Speakers Association New England, a certified professional speaker, DSP, and the author of various books, including Office Influence, Get What You Want from the Mailroom to the Boardroom, and The CIO's Guide to Staff Needs, Growth, and Productivity. Prior to his current role, Eric was a senior IT executive at various firms, including Fidelity Investment, Monster.com, and Independence Investment. With no further ado, I bring you Eric Bloom. Hello all, thank you for the introduction. And enough about me, why don't we move now directly to material which we'll be doing from here throughout the rest of our time together. Is, uh, as you know, the topic that we're gonna be speaking on is uh, basically the future of IT as it relates to, uh, to workforce, et cetera. Um, and to do that, we're gonna go through basically the following steps during today's talk together. The first is I just like to step back for a moment to set the context and talk about uh, the, uh, the IT ramifications of the move home. From there, we'll talk about the workforce implications of moving back to the office. Certainly not extensively, but just some key things that we need to think about. From there, we'll talk about some technical trends that will definitely be affecting IT's future workplace. From there, with that context set, then we'll be talking about uh, the future IT workplace drivers, namely what's driving the future workplace, as well as alternatives that we'll have open to us. And then lastly, from here, and certainly a major part of the presentation, will be the future of the IT workplace itself. So to begin, Let's start by talking about uh, basically the ramifications of the move home, something I'm sure we've all experienced. But now, thinking of it from an IT-centric perspective is, is that for IT, the movement to, of everyone going home, certainly it was painful as it was for everyone to have to do it, figure out the processes and how we're going to do it and so on. But at least for IT, in some ways, it was very straightforward. The reason is, is that because IT has, virtu has, has, has had virtual teams both across the US and across the world for many, many years. I know I've looked back at my career. I think you can tell maybe by the color of my hair. I've been at this for a while. Um, I had uh, virtual teams reporting to me from an IT perspective at various times over my career for over a 25-year period. So it's something we're more accustomed to within our profession. Next is the nature of IT's work is primarily being knowledge-based. Certainly we have people that need to go to desks and servers need to be installed and things along that line. But primarily, particularly on the app dev, help desk and many other areas, is that the work can, is basically monitor-centric, namely sitting in front of a computer with a keyboard getting work done. Now, um, as a result of that, you know, it allowed IT people to more easily move to a work from home environment. Because effectively what was happening, we were just taking our monitor and keyboard from here, and putting it over there. Uh, but also, you know, IT professionals, as you might expect, are a little bit more comfortable with technology. So as a result of that, moving toward things like, uh, like Slack, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, WebEx, et cetera, was more natural to us. Many of us were either using this directly in our business or we were supporting it for our business users within our organization. Oops, there we go. But at the same time, what was also going on was IT was pressured to help others. Why, in fact, we were trying to help ourselves. So as we were trying to you know, get our teams at home, 
we also had to help ev uh, everyone else, accounting and finance and uh, human resources, manufacturing, engineering, sales, marketing. We provided a key role in helping them get home also, you know, with technology and, uh, and so on. Uh, also, from a best practices perspective, we knew how to do a fair amount of this. So we were also acting in many firms as sort of a center of excellence of how do you have people work at home or work in a virtual environment. So as a result, you know, IT in many ways also became the test bed for, um, you know, for the new type of virtual processes and technologies that had to be set up. And also, it was really nice in many firms, what it did was it elevated IT internally and strategically to have a seat at the strategic table. Because quite frankly, with everyone working from home, no discussions and no work was getting done without the proper technology to facilitate. Also, you know, you, it's interesting, seeing this in the press a lot, you know, they say, you know, what was the biggest driver in the last, uh, say, 12 to 18 months to a digital transformation? You know, was it IT? Was it the business? Was it data being the new oil? You know, all of the things you hear. What, you know, what lots of research has shown is the biggest driver for the past, say, 12 to 18 months, the digital transformation and digital strategy has actually been the work from home environment and COVID. What it also did was it, uh, it also expanded IT's technical requirements. This one was one that was harder for us, is that now all of a sudden people in the help desk, for example, is now in addition to supporting computer hardware and software that are physically within the firewall in the office, now all of a sudden, in many cases, it was off pers people's personal equipment at home. So it really widened the range, not only ge uh, geographically, but also the type of software, the types of issues, the type of bandwidth, if, band, bandwidth issues that were coming forward. Because uh, you know, uh, in the office again, everyone has high-speed internet. Not necessarily the case where people specifically live. But in addition to that, as we know, technology doesn't stand still. So what happened was, is there's a flurry of technology process cultural and economic activities that have been going on over these last 18 months. So as we think of the future, we can't just think of it from moving from home back to the office. We have to look at it from a more holistic and wider perspective. In particular, these things include technical, you know, data comm, certainly cybersecurity has, you know, continued to be an arms race between, say, the good guys and the bad guys, um, but also home office setup. A lot of people have really enhanced their ability to work from home. We'll talk a lot more about that one as we go forward. But also many process changes were made. You know, in, the, in uh, 2020, of uh, February and March, when everyone all of a sudden is starting to move from home, all companies were looking around and saying, oh my God, how are we gonna run all of our operations and basically say, stay a solvent organization from home? You know, like for example, the accounts payable, the accounts receivable people, all of a sudden they have to be able to get transactions out of their house to be able to bill customers and where the checks go. You know, I mean, there were so many issues related to all of that. And all of this became adjusted and well, is working over time. The next is cultural. And what I mean by cultural is cultural within the company. The company's culture has actually been modified. You know, in many firms I know is that uh, when someone worked from home for a day, you know, like for example, I had an old boss of mine, this was many years ago, and I say, hey, uh, you know, I'm expecting a, a big delivery and uh, you know, my wife is working today, any chance I can work from home? And my boss actually looked at me and said, oh, uh, sure thing, uh, have a good day off. I said, no, I'm gonna be working from home. No, sure you are. So what happened was, is through COVID, it totally transformed the thought of the ability of people to be able to work at home because everybody's doing it and has now personally experienced it. In addition to that, certainly there's economic changes that are being made um, now, or that are happening around. Now, what's been really interesting is if you followed it at all from industry to industry, it's fascinating to see, you know, there were definite winners and losers over the past 18 months. Certainly you think of, you know, like the airplane industry or the hotel or travel, uh, entertainment industry is certainly dramatically negatively affected. It's, it's truly been a shame to see what's happened to, you know, financially to many of those organizations. But other organizations have just, you know, flourished through this. I know one organization that sells uh, uh, vitamins and things along that line. They have everybody but the president of the company putting stuff in boxes because everybody's to ship because everybody's trying to be as healthy as possible. So all of these little niches and industries and such that, you know, I never thought of would be affected. In fact, in many cases dramatically are 
um, simply just because of you know luck of the draw of people needed their products, they were able to pivot in time. Um, or you know, like I say for myself very often, if I can't be smart, I'm happy to be lucky. But in addition to company-related changes, there were also a number of changes related to the employees, to our employee base. First of all, there's now increased interest in working from home. People, many people I know said, oh, I, I liked going into the office every day. But now a year and a half at home, you know, just being able to, you know, uh, go into their kitchen to get some, uh, uh, to get coffee, sort of, uh, let's say that they were 45 minute drive in and a 45 minute drive out. Well, the 45 minute drive in that they don't need it, they're using it to exercise, to, you know, go for a walk and get out to the gym. The 45 minutes uh, on the way home, they're now, uh, they've taken, I uh, have a friend actually who took up cooking as a, um, you know, as a hobby. So as a result, he's still getting the same eight, or in some cases, 10 hour days done, you know, work done. But then, you know, he basically goes from here, gets up from his desk, turns around and poof, there's his kitchen. You know, he was able, he's really able to take on many of those responsibilities that he's always wanted to and hadn't been because of, uh, of the length of his commute. In addition to that, other things is that families are relocating to their favorite location. You know, look at many of the urban centers around the country. You know, people working in the in downtown in a city, you know, and living at that city or immediately in a suburb are now saying, hey, if I'm working virtual and my company's thinking they're always going to work virtual, I'm going to move from here, say, back to, um, you know, back to Connecticut where I'm from or to the Midwest or wherever, because it doesn't matter where you are, assuming you can still have connectivity if you'll be allowed to work virtual for a longer term. Um, next is home workplaces have gotten enhanced. Um, you know, whether, whether it be, you know, nicer computers, uh, forming out a, a room in the house, you know, having an appropriate background for you, which is me, as you can see, is basically a painted wall. Is an interesting thing is that uh, I've been doing this type of work for a long time. The wall behind me used to be white. But well, as my hair turned from gray to white, what happened was I was on a, I forget one of the technologies, and from here up, it looked like I had no head. So I thought it was time to repaint the wall. But anyway, everybody's making those type of adjustments to be more comfortable, more, um, you know, more, uh, you know, safer working at home. And what I mean by safer is I have a friend who, when he moved home, his idea of a workspace was sitting on his nice cushy sofa with his laptop on his lap. And basically for the last year, he's been typing like this, and what's happened is he now has back and back and uh, shoulder and neck problems, and he's got a little bit of carpal tunnel in his wrists. Why? Because he didn't have the proper ergonomic workstations that he had from the office. People are adjusting to that because they have to. Uh, also, family routines have changed. You know, in other words, who's you know who's caring for kids? An earlier shift or a later shift? Certainly, in many many places um, that uh, certainly heavily in Canada right now, I've just learned, but also many places in the U.S. Kids are at home. So it's changed the way that um, the people and family requirements and routines and uh, roles have established. So from here now, let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about the workforce implications now of moving back to the office. Well, let's start by talking about some of the barriers of return. The first of which is many IT employees want to continue to work virtually. They said, hey, I never saw a good reason for me to go into the office now. And hey, you know what? I like not having to uh, take a train into the city or uh, to drive 45 minutes to get somewhere or just they like rolling out of bed. And a lot of people I know what they've done is if they had a 45 minute commute on each side, uh, what they're doing is, is they're considering, still considering that part of their work day, 45 here, 45 there. They're getting an extra hour and a half in their work day without it taking one minute out of their personal, uh, out of their personal life. But also what's happened is, is previously stated uh, uh, employee, uh, a previously stated employee um, personal changes, uh, all of the ones we previously mentioned, you know, moving, moving to other places, et cetera. Um, also, what you're seeing now is a lot of offices, to their credit, as they're preparing people to move back into the office, you know, they've redone where the desks are, they've put up all of the appropriate us um, COVID safeguards. However, for people who have to get there by public transportation, whether that be commuter rail based or, uh, you know, or, um, you know, regular, um, you know, um, train based, that kind of thing, uh, subway is what I was looking for. Uh, they feel really, really uncomfortable at this point and probably for an extended length of time, you know, taking those public transportations. Also new family obligations, you know, as people working from home as things have changed. A lot of people also feel they're much more productive at home. 
Why? Because nobody's bothering them. And if you're in a knowledge worker type role, like most people in IT are, you know, to have, you know, not have the things in the periphery, to be able to grab your cup of coffee in the morning, sit down and begin banging away on the work you need to get done, uh, a much more productive in that case. <clears throat> also, companies are actually uh, changing their physical space to not have enough employee to, uh, to basically be safe and move people farther apart. But what that means is less desks. There's also a number of organizations I know that what they're doing is they're sitting back and going, hey, this virtual stuff is working pretty well. So what they're doing is instead of having two big floors in a big building, what they're doing is they're giving up one of the floors, which they've been paying, say, an enormous amount of rent for on a monthly or yearly basis. And they're telling half their employees to say, hey, you know what? Stay working at home. You like it, saves the company money. It's a win for everybody. So therefore, you know, decisions are going to have to be made moving forward about who's in and who's out of the office. Um, also, is technology has moved forward. You know, a lot of people haven't been physically in their office for the last year and a half. Well, you know what? Um, there's changes on how, uh, how email is being distributed. Certainly, a lot of phone systems are moving from in-house phone systems to now being done cloud-based different infrastructures, people who had, uh, say, either uh, Juniper or, um, you know, Juniper servers or uh, Cisco servers, you know, that they use, I mean, uh, routers rather, that they're using internally, that over the past year and a half have gone out of service. You know, great equipment, both companies, all companies that provides that. But you know what, at some point, the stuff gets old. So, you know, is that people are starting to have to go in, there's preparation that's required in order to move people back into the office from an IT perspective. And uh, also, you know, there's a lot of home office best practices that have been put in place in the last 12 to 18 months that can get employees sort of looking at themselves like, well, why, why do we really want to go back? We have it all working now. Another thing that we need to consider is that new employees that have been hired over the past, say, 18 months, uh, many of them, you know, you might say, hey, you know, I can hire anybody from anywhere because we're working from home. So as a result, say that you are, uh, you know, you're in Massachusetts. You hire someone from Florida, same time zone, and we'll talk more about the time zone stuff later. It's great. They're doing good work. Well, you know what? When you try to get everybody back into the office, that new great employee that you hired who's living down in Fort Lauderdale doesn't want to move up to Boston. So all of a sudden, how do you deal with issues of that type? Now, also, there's some other key factors that make moving back into the office now um, more complex. One of them is, is moving home, it was easy for senior management to say, hey, everybody, sorry, it's state or federal law that you have to move home. What can you do? We'll figure out how to do it. So everybody said, okay. And, you know, they certainly had their own concerns related to, you know, catching COVID or taking the trains in, et cetera. So people were, you know, okay with it. What could you do? But moving people back in, that's a management decision. So now it's not, oh, you know, the law says you have to do it. Okay. But now it's, gee, you know, why are you bringing us back? We're productive at home. You know, that, those type issues will also fall into it. Whoop. Also is, is that IT can't act just by itself. It has to follow what the senior leadership says. So if the, if the president of the company says, no, you know what, we want everybody back in the office, then, you know, that's going to be uh, an issue uh, if you as IT want people to be able to stay where they are. Um, next, whoop, there we go. Uh, and next is, is that IT must also, just like when everyone was moving home, IT was in the middle of that to help everybody figure out how to get the firewalls working, you know, you know, whether it be security, whether it be additional applications, whether it be hardware. I know companies that actually drop shift a second terminal, you know, a second monitor to everybody at home. Wow, terminal. I guess I'm uh, showing my old IT days. But anyway, a, uh, a second monitor to their homes to let them be more productive to connect it up to their laptops. So how is that all going to be handled? So anyway, with that, now let's move to our third topic. Remember, we're moving toward the future of IT a little at a time. Next is, as we all know, technology doesn't stand still either. And there's a number of trends going on in technology that's going to change not only the types of jobs within IT itself, but also the technologies that you'll be using within those jobs, either that have stayed stagnant or have moved. So now let's move to that. Um, first is movement toward cloud-based architectures. I mean, this is certainly something that's been going on for years, long, long before COVID. Uh, in fact, what I would say is I don't even consider cloud computing a trend anymore. What I consider it is as enabling technology for all of the new trends that are going on. 
But if you think of it from this perspective, is is that um, you know all, uh, uh, any vendor in the last 18 months who's come out with um, a cloud-based version of their on-prem, you know, their on-premises based software, you know that all their best people are working on the cloud stuff, that if they do enhancements at all to the on-prem software anymore, it's going to be later sort of a day late and a dollar short kind of thing, because what they're really moving toward is away from on-premises toward cloud-based work. So all of a sudden, you might have half a dozen applications that you've been using in-house inside your firewall, which need to be upgraded. Uh, which obviously has staff ramifications both on those um, supporting that software as well as having to learn the new cloud protocols and such. Um, enhances, uh, enhancements and IT cloud software development platforms. I mean, if you see the kind of things that now you can do, just the, the modular components within either AWS or Azure or others, it's just great. It's incredible the kind of, uh, of you know, technology development tools you now have at your, at your fingertips. Um, also, there's a push by IT employees themselves to want to move towards these cloud-based architectures and cloud-based technologies if they want to stay marketable and move ahead with their career. Next is this accelerated movement toward, uh, another thing that accelerates movement toward the cloud is let's say, for example, I'm going to pick on um, email, Microsoft Exchange and Microsoft Outlook. Uh, let's say, for example, that I'm a CIO. Well, not hard to think about that. I used to be. Uh, but anyway, is let's say, for example, that I had um, that the license for my Microsoft Exchange server was coming due, and I had it on a great big piece of, hard, of uh, Windows hardware, Windows server, that was now going past life, is that I have a couple of decisions, a uh, decision I make. I can either go out and buy a great new piece of hardware to put my email on and upgrade my licenses to Exchange, or what I can do, maybe it'd be a great time to move to Outlook 365. So a lot of these kind of decisions are going to be made within IT, which has dramatic changes of how IT's budget is spent, um, but also is, is that um, the skill sets that needed to support these new architectures. The next thing is just phone systems, is uh, you know, the, the old internal, internal phone systems that exist. Certainly they work well. They've been the, work for the, uh, the workhorse in the industry for, what, 30 years or plus. Um, but now, all of a sudden, all these PBXs, where do you see them? They're cloud-based, which allows them to connect to your cell phone, to connect to other items, and can be centralized. These are additional technology things that IT people, like, for example, a phone system. Who's been thinking about a phone system when everybody's working from home? Now, all of a sudden, you get everybody back in the office, and you realize your licenses need to be signed, et cetera. This is going to change the required skill set and the work of the people working in this area. Um, the next is methodological changes, you know, is uh, continued, continued movement towards sort of that agile waterfall integration. Uh, actually, I like to refer to it as wagile, not a word that I made up, but I sort of wish I did. Uh, but anyway, which is, you know, what's the methodology that's going to work for you that's going to be changing, actually, because of the, the movements of all the things we showed in the previous slide, the cloud. Um, next is design thinking is all the rage you know, is a methodology, it's based around human-centered design. You know, you don't just go and get asked, as a business analyst, go and ask the requirements anymore. Now you go and you live them a little bit and then bring that knowledge back to figure out the definition of what should be built. Cybersecurity, not only is it, it used to be what they call sort of the, uh, the castle mentality, where you'd protect all the bad guys from getting in, but, uh, but once they get in, you're in big trouble, just like, you know, old castles. Um, but now is what it is, is that it's being permutated into everything. There's actually some software out there now that will analyze software that's written to find the security holes in it. I mean, I just find that mind boggling as, a, as an app developer myself by background. I just think that I think the official technical term is it's really cool. Uh, but next is the movement toward DevOps. If you're not familiar with DevOps, uh, you know, you might want to write it down, D-E-V-O-P-S, and Google it just after we talk today. But it's the bringing together. It's actually initially driven by Agile because all of these develop the developers are now pumping out something new for production every couple of weeks, and the operations people couldn't handle it. So what they're doing is, is this is a full different combined methodology to move things more quickly from completed development directly into the production systems. Now, in addition to all that, um, there's also some technological advances now that are, gonna, that are driving the functionality of, our, of not only our IT future workplace, but the future workplace of everyone who's going to be the receiver of these systems that will be implemented. And what are they? Uh, certainly enhanced virtual communication. 
you know, is look what's happened now. Everybody's talking, working virtually through Zoom, through WebEx, through Microsoft Teams, you know, through, um, through Slack. These technologies are going to continue. Um, there's enormous amounts of R&D money going into driving it. Uh, soon, you know, who knows, maybe they'll, you'll have holograms that when you put on your glasses, it can really look like Bill is standing five feet away from you if he has his glasses on also. Um, you know, these things are coming. Um, but also other technologies are the cloud-based modular components that I mentioned. You want to add, say, a, a voice bot to any front end of an application that you have up in the cloud. It's basically, it's almost like plug and play. It's a little more than that, certainly, but sort of that neck of the woods. But in addition to that, you're seeing more and more virtual and augmented reality and machine learning. And now blockchain, you see more and more built into machine learning and blockchain, I should see built into the, the base components of applications that are being created. Ah, okay, now from all that, now let's move toward the future, uh, future IT wor um, workplace drivers and uh, alternatives. Well, you basically have three alternatives from a workplace perspective. What they are is, you know, as certainly, God willing, as COVID ends soon and people are able to do what we did before in the old days. And by the old days, I mean January of 2019. Um, I'm sorry, of uh, 2020, uh, forgive me, is one alternative is everybody goes back to the office. In other words, all right, everybody, you know, it's safe. Every, you know, this is all taken care of. Let's go back to where we were. You know, a week from Tuesday, everybody's back in. Next is it's hybrid. What hybrid is, is you'll have a certain percentage of your workforce physically back into the office, but you'll have other employees who are permanently stationed to work out of their home. Sort of like the example is if you had two floors in a building and to save money, you basically uh, give up the lease on one of those two floors, then everyone who was working on that floor would be permanently located at home. Certainly they might occasionally come into the office, but their primarily, primary workspace will be, will be from their home location rather than in the office. And then certainly, as you might expect, the third one is fully virtual, is that basically that is in many ways just a continuation of what we're doing now. But now let's look at the drivers behind some of these things. Now keep in mind, I'm looking at it now from an IT perspective. However, 90% of this is actually uh, very applicable to all other professions for anyone who happens to be in on it. But anyway, the first driver, as you might expect, it's what senior management decides they want their company to be. You know, I mean, every company can be doing whatever it might be doing, but if your company says, Don, it, we want everybody back in the office on September 1st, then guess what? That's the environment that you'll have based on your firm, based on senior management's decision. Next is, it's the economic conditions of your firm coming out of COVID. You know, is some firms, again, they're just doing, it, it, it's been a boon for them. It's just been incredible in regard to their revenue. Unfortunately, for many, many, many more firms, a higher percentage of firms, it's certainly been somewhere between awful and devastating to them financially. So, you know, what can they do? Maybe they have, maybe they'd love to get people back into the office, but they can't afford the workspace anymore. So they have to have people working from home, even if they don't particularly like it. Next is, is it, for the particular industry or work you're doing, think of this as, you know, for, uh, for a year and a half now, they've been calling it essential workers. But the thing is, is, is it possible based on what your company does as its primary and core product line, can they work from home? Now, how that affects IT is, let's say, for example, that it's a manufacturing building, a manufacturing type, uh, type company. Well, certainly the people doing the manufacturing, the hands-on, you know, screw this in, do, you know, do this, is they physically have to be there, of course. But then how much does IT need to be there? What I would say is maybe a lot depending on what they're doing. Certainly if they're working on uh, implementing a new software package, they can do that from home. But if they're doing CAD CAM, if they're connecting in for physical devices that are now being used by the manufacturing people that need to be supported. So a fair amount of which one of those three models you'll be in is what your company does for a living. Um, next is just industry and technology trends that are going on that will make it easier for you or harder to, to be able to, uh, to work from home or in the office. Next is just employees' willingness to come back to the office. I know a number of people who've said to me, you know, when I say, hey, you're gonna go back to the office, you know, when, uh, when, when your company does it? And they said, no, they've just decided they're gonna work from home. And if they have to change companies to do it, they will. 
So as a result, what kind of sort of pressure and decision making does that put on sort of the CIO or IT or basically company management to say, wow, our three best people have said they're going to leave if we don't let them work from home. You know, maybe we should move to a hybrid environment. So not all of this is because employees have the ability to vote with their feet, particularly in a good economy, you know, which hopefully we'll be coming out into. Um, you know, management might be able to have their hands out tied a little bit as to what they can do. And then for our next, whoops, oh, well, one other thing, post-COVID employee footprint, culture, and processes. What I mean by this is that by sort of the, its footprint is cultures or internal company cultures are a little different right now. Our processes have been dramatically modified to work in other ways. And certainly new technologies have been brought in to facilitate everyone being able to work virtually. Now, why did companies do it? They didn't do it because they wanted to. I mean, maybe some wanted to, but they did it as a matter of survival. And as a result, it got a lot more money, a lot more attention, and a lot higher quality than it ever would have been if they said, oh, yeah, let's just make it easier, I guess, for people to work from home once in a while if they want to. I mean, some serious infrastructure processes and culture has taken place over the last year and a half. You know, if this whole thing, unfortunately, it's too bad that if this whole COVID thing, you know, that started when people moved home from March, well, if in April, you know, everybody was back in the office, then nothing would have changed. It would have sort of continued of how it was going. But because of the length of time, new habits were formed and all the other things that we spoke about. What that brings us to is our next topic. And uh, this is good. We're actually right on schedule where we want to be. Um, and what this is, is now let's talk with this whole background set. Um, now let's talk about the actual future of the IT workplace, given all of the, you know, the changes in technology, in people, in movement, in industry, in economics, in all of those other things, is these are some of the things you can expect moving forward. The first of which is, and there's good news, bad news on this slide. If you're the type of IT organization that is a late adopter to technology, now you may want to be an early adopter, but you know, senior management might not give you the funding. But the thing is, is because what will happen is, is late adopters to technology will most likely lose a number of their forward thinking IT talent. In other words, the best people in your team. The reason is, and also by the way, it will be harder for you to hire top talent um, the reason being is because the, competi the, the competition to hire your people just got global. So think about it. Let's say, for example, well, I'll say I'm in a suburb of Boston and say that my IT shop, Don, it, I wanted everybody to come back into the office. All right, well, let's, and as a result, they're going to be coming in. But let's say there's this great technology company, say, I'll pick on Florida again, just because I picked on it for an earlier example. In Florida, same time zone kind of thing. And they're saying, gee, you know, I know uh, about Eric Bloom's company. He got some great talent there. You know, what we're going to do is we're going to go there. He has everybody coming back into the office. And all of a sudden now we're competing nationally or internationally to keep our same people. And now the good news is though, is that if you're the type of tech, if you're the type of IT shop that is an early adopter or at least a current adopter of technologies, in other words, as, as new stuff comes in, you're trying to keep current in all of those. What it will do for you is that, uh, you know, it, first of all, remember that IT has returned to the, um, to the uh, strategy table, you know, business strategy table. Why? Because they had to include us. IT is a key component now of, uh, of driving digital transformation. So you know what? If you're forward thinking, then IT should be able to continue with that role. Next is, is that IT has been much more highly visible. Why? Because it had to be. Because all of a sudden new processes had to be done. Um, the technology at firms now couldn't be taken for granted. So at a, as a result of that, these companies that are forward adopters, not only do they get a seat at the table, but also, you know, is this seen as a true business partner, which enhances what? IT morale and um, the professional opportunity for those people working within the company. What it also does is it gives you a wider pool to now hire people from. Why? Because if you're either in a, in a hybrid or uh, working, go to a, a full virtual type environment, you know how before I said that, uh, well, if I'm in Boston, people in Florida might want to steal my people. Well, let's say that I'm that company in Florida. Now, cool, I can hire people from all up the eastern seaboard, and it's not even a time zone switch. And again, that time zone switch we'll be talking about again in a moment. Now, um, 
also going forward, regardless if you're in an office, your full office, back to office, a hybrid or a home scenario, whichever one of those three you select, you know, there are certain things that will be making, that will be happening for all types of firms rolling out of COVID. First of all, that'll of course be the continued movement toward cloud methodology and the technology trends that we were previously talking about. One thing about IT is it never stands still. Next is, um, uh, there'll be continual enhancements in these interpersonal communications. I mentioned that earlier from a technology perspective. You know, uh, enhanced features in Zoom, that now it's breakout sessions is now even in Teams was added more recently. You know, and it's just gonna be getting better and better and better and more integrated, why? Because it's now the market. It's where everyone's going. Again, billions of dollars is being invested into new technologies to sort of do what we're doing now. Um, next is um, international competition wanting to hire away your local talent. Why? Because they can. You know, is that uh, because if they're working virtual, who cares where the people are? Now, there's time zone related issues that certainly need to be dealt with. But basically, you're just not competing locally now. That's going to be an issue for you. Also, there's, you know, people will be continually reviewing, you know, the, the work from home policies. Because you're going to have people sort of on one side saying, oh, well, we should have everybody working from home. And people on the other side saying, oh, we should have everybody working at the office. And it's going to be a continued push-pull between the two, with, you know, more so than was ever done before. Um, also, there'll be a higher respect for people working at home, you know, work, at, work from home days. Why? Because everybody's done it now. And, you know, work, what, did we, what did we used to do in the old days, you know, January 2020, when we worked at home? We made sure to send lots of emails through the day so that people would actually know we're working. Well, now, since everybody's been experiencing, they actually know that we're working. And also, there's going to be less business travel. Uh, the reason I say that is because people have gotten very, very, um, uh, you know, uh, have gotten very used to um, working with people virtually. So as a result of that, maybe me, let's say that uh, I'm in Boston, as I said, let's say that I have a team of mine or just people I need to converse with in Chicago, is rather than me fly to Chicago now, it's a lot more cost effective and it's a lot more productivity effective if I can do it to just be on a, uh, you know, on a, you know, Zoom or Teams or WebEx or whatever tool you're using all day because people have gotten really, really good at, at uh, communicating through these visual means. So this is another thing which will also, quite frankly, save your company money and save you time and a little bit of wear and tear on your body. Anyone who's done a lot of travel knows what I mean. Um, next is, now let's talk about some additional things. Again, those are gonna be for every on all businesses. But let's say your business makes the decision. You know what? Everybody's coming back to the office. I have spoken, everybody's coming back. Then what's gonna happen is, is there's gonna be continued push on an ongoing basis for people who would like to work at home to be able to work at home. Also, what's going to happen is that uh, vir companies who are 100% virtual, they're going to be using their virtualness, basically, you know, saying, hey, come to work for us and you can work from home if you'd like to. So as a result is that I know some companies that are pur purposely looking at what their comp competitive firms are doing to see if they're going to be bringing back in the office. Or not. One firm, again, I can't say the industry of the company, who's made the decision that, you know what, everybody's going to work from home because they've really got it tuned well. And they're in the type of industry where that makes sense to happen. And they're looking at all the other firms that, uh, that they're competing against. And as soon as one of them says everybody's back in the office, they're going right after their teams to do it. So this is another issue that's coming up. Um, next is company culture. You know, we'll be moving again. If you're bringing everyone back to the office, it will slowly, not completely, but move back toward what the culture and the practices were like before COVID. Um, and lastly is the use of video will be just continually used. I mean, I can see now, even if everyone's in the office, say in different floors or, you know, like the building next door kind of thing, is that everything will be done virtually because people can do it from their work desk, just easier than having to drag everybody down to a central conference room that's a five minute walk. Now, um, if you're in a hybrid scenario, which is what I see is a lot of companies going toward, you know, some people working from home, some in the office, some having the opportunity to do each. But if you're going to do it, this is going to be enormously complex. Uh, you're going to have to deal with issues like, all right, who, who makes the decisions of who can work at home and who comes into the office? 
This is another thing that needs to be considered. Is it going to be by the employee's choice? Is it going to be by job type? Is it going to be by department? Is it going to be by business function? How is all of this going to be decided so people don't feel like there's winners and losers? Um, next is, whoops, there we go, is they're going to have to have between the two, you know, for people working at home and people working in the office, is uh, establishing synchronous and asynchronous communication that will work regardless of where you were. So people will be relying heavily on processes since people are still in different places of what's been done over the 18 month, last 18 months. Next is, is defining sort of the in-home, um, uh, the in-office, at-home communication time. Because think about it, like I'm working from home now. You know, I see an email come in, I'm sitting at my desk anyway, maybe I'm in a meeting, oh, poof, I can send an email back. But in the office, if you're in four hours worth of meetings, you know, it's really frowned upon, if you remember, to, you know, be sitting in a meeting with five other people and you take out your cell phone and you start, you know, doing the thumb dance here to return some emails. All right, very frowned upon. It's considered really rude, which means if I'm trying to get an email, if I send an urgent email to someone in an office, I mean, someone working in the office who's in a three-hour meeting, they're not going to get back to me till after lunch. All right, now, I might be insulted with that because I'm not used to that environment anymore. Other things are is creating specific hybrid best practices in regard to communication, in regard to business process, because right now everything is virtual. Well, you have half the people back in the office. Maybe it can come up with enhanced processes that take advantage of both. Um, and in fact, you know, will reduce costs, drive productivity, things along that line. Um, also, if you're going to have be having people out of the office, um, sometimes they come back in. So as a result, what you're going to have to do first is decide, hey, what is their home office going to be like? In other words, now that you can come back to the office, companies can dictate and say, hey, if you're going to work from home, you have to have the, fo uh, the following five things. You have to have high speed internet. You have to have a quality ergonomic chair and desk. Um, the reason that they're doing that is to protect you. You know, like my friend who was basically, you know, sitting there on a sofa and now has carpal tunnel issues in his wrists, all right, is, is that, so that can be required because now, now it's, well, you're working from home, what can they say? But if now it's, hey, you know, you're not following our rules for how to work at home, come on back in. Um, but also is, is that when people come in or come in occasionally is there's hoteling, which basically you make a reservation to come back in and what you're, you're on a particular day. And there's a, an area of desks and cubes, you know, that you can just basically reserve. one. And then they have what they call a uh, hot desking. What hot desking is, is you just show up and they figure out where to put you. You know, it might be in a main area where people can set up desks on a first come first serve basis. But if there's more people than that, then there's sort of a, a, a process in place to take over a conference room or, hey, who's out of the office this week? You know, and they'll just put you in Joe's office, you know, to try to figure out where to put you as people come in. You know, neither one of those is certainly undoable, but it's just another set of business processes you have to think about. And also most important, um, is that if you have people working at home permanently and working in the office permanently, is that you have a one team, any location culture. Because one of the biggest dangers of this is the bifurcation between you have a home culture and a work culture, and the two don't like each other or work together. It can cause all sorts of problems on your firm. Um, next is in for the full scenario, basically is that full working, working from home is here. It's You'll basically do what you're doing now with some improved policies, uh, continued productivity and create and uh, creativity type um, methodologies will come up, processes will come up, because companies have really made the decision and the investment to do this person, uh, permanently. Second of all, from a hiring perspective, and by the way, this is true whether you're fully virtual or in a hybrid environment, is what I, what I like to call time zone uh, virtual banding. And by banding, I mean your time zone band. So let's say that I'm in Chicago and I'm willing to go one, one, um, one time zone to the left and one time zone to the right to hire people, then I can hire people from Northern Canada to the tip of South America. Why? Because they're all in our same time zone, you know, give or take an hour. Um, so that's, that's all fine if they're virtual anyway. So what it does is, you know, if you think about it, even, you know, working virtually, if you're working with someone, you know, on the other side of the world, it's still sort of painful when you can talk to them, when you can set up meetings, you're sleeping, when they're working and vice versa. But using time zone banding, everybody is available at the same time, every day, every, uh, every day, all the time. Um, other things is, is that uh, you're going to have to, you'll be able to hire people away from your competition. From where? From that, everybody back to the office policy. That was like that company in Florida who say is fully virtual and wants to hire my people because darn it, I'm bringing them back into the office. 
So what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to end and then just open it up to questions um, by leaving you a, uh, with a great quote and then just a little bit of information on some upcoming classes. Um, but my final quote is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. That's both in your firms and with your careers and actually also with you personally. So from here, what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, turn it back over to, uh, um, you know, to, um, uh, to our ProTech folks to describe some classes that we have coming up and for, uh, to, to help to facilitate our uh, question and answer. Great, thank you, Eric. I, I do have a couple of questions here for you. Mm -hmm. And um, anyone, if, please feel free, you can still enter questions if you have them into the question area and the control panel. But the first question is, which scenario do you see will be the most common or do you think will be the most common? All, the all in office, hybrid or totally virtual? Okay, let me say, unless there's a reason why everyone has to move back to the office, you know, just because of the work that's being performed, um, then what I definitely see is it's gonna lean toward hybrid or full work from home. Um, from the, uh, the, I would say that the one that we'll be seeing the most will be hybrid. The reason being is, is because most companies are want to, gonna wanna keep some type of corporate footprint, which means people have to be there. But at the same time is that they're gonna wanna be reducing rent or they're gonna wanna take advantage of the things like the time zone banding to increase their, uh, you know, the, their hiring pool and so on. So I would say is probably most companies, just again, because they need some physical presence, uh, will probably be moving toward hybrid. Uh, the next most popular, what I would say, would be, you know, companies, particularly if they're in, you know, let's say some type, some type of IT consulting or whatnot, um, they will be fully virtual. But again, I would put it right in the middle with hybrid. Great question, by the way. Thank you, whoever asked that. Great. Um, another question here for you. How can I prevent companies outside of our geographic area from trying to hire away our IT staff? Another good question. Okay. Well, let me say you can't prevent them from trying but you can prevent them from succeeding. And the way that you prevent them from ultimately hiring away your team is doing all of those things that we're supposed to do as companies and as managers to basically motivate our uh, and build loyalty in our staffs. So from an IT perspective, what I would say is keep up on current technologies, give your people to the extent they can great things to work on, properly train your first time your, your first line managers because in any IT organization or any organization really about 85% of your team certainly the whole technical team reports to first time first line managers and supervisors so make sure that they have the that they're equipped with the proper skills in fact to be able to make everybody who your competition is going to try to hire away keeping them happy and engaged and so on you know, remember that people join companies and lead managers. Very, very important point. Um, and this one really ties into the, the notion that hybrid is probably going to be the most popular. Um, if we move to a hybrid workforce, what is my biggest potential issue? <laughs> uh, that's easy. Your biggest potential I I issue, and I, I alluded to it, but went by it quickly. Uh, but what that is, is it's a bi uh, bifurcated um, culture. In other words, is that the people in the office, uh, working in the office, sort of look down a little bit at everybody working from home. They're not part of the cool kids, so to speak. And what, what can happen over time, if management doesn't properly drive parity between those working at home and those working in the office, then what will happen is, is the people in the office will rightly so start to feel a little bit more privileged. In other words, who'll be getting the best projects, who's most likely to get promoted, who's least likely to get laid off if there's another in issue. Because of that, who's most likely to get a bigger raise when, when uh, performance measurement time comes. So as a result, the biggest issue and what companies need to be really, really careful of if they're moving to this permanent blended model is, is that everyone in the company really feels like they're being equally treated and not sort of as a, a second class citizen if you're virtual. Um, or whatnot, you know, and there's, there's lots of tricks, like for example, regarding in meetings. If you have a meeting and say two or more people are virtual, uh, so say five people are in the office and three people are at home, have all those people in the office do it from their office desks so everybody can be in the same playing field by everybody being virtual within the same Zoom call. So that's probably the biggest issue is trying to maintain not only true parity, but perceived parity between those working at home and those working in the office. 
very interesting. I, I never would have thought of that, but it makes absolute perfect sense that that would happen and that would be a threat. Um, so that actually concludes the questions that have come in, which takes me to the slide that you have on your screen right now, looking at two of your upcoming courses on our public schedule here at ProTech, and both of which are three-day courses, lab and lecture, taught in a um, very interactive way. It's, it's virtual training, but it's done where they can, the students may fully interact with you, um, Eric, which will be great because uh, it, it's been a very interesting presentation and I'm sure people will um, look forward to working with you. So I can't think of anything else. Yeah, well, let me so, just say you... that both of these classes uh, have been taught virtually monthly for like seven years. So we have a way to do it, even though it's sort of a lot of time in a virtual perspective. Anyway, I'm sorry I interrupted. No, that's okay. Actually, it, it's perfect because in that time, a question has come in, uh, mm -hmm. another question, and it says, an argument against working from home I have heard in the past was that time zone banding may result in tax complications if you work in one province or state and work for a company based in another province or state. What are your thoughts on this? Is this really uh, a barrier? Uh, yes, you know, I mean, for that, certainly talk to, you know, your, your, your accountant on that. But generally speaking, it could depend. Like, for example, let's say that, uh, um, you know, that I, uh, my company is based in Montreal and I'm based in Boston, but a full-time employee of that. Well, certainly, you know, many corporations for many, many years have employees working from a physical location other than the corporate headquarters. So I would venture to say is that uh, if the com main company is in uh, Montreal, I'm not paying Montreal local taxes. I'll be, paying local, I'll be paying local taxes as to where I physically reside. So, you know, certainly I'm not an accountant. I never played one on TV. But what I would say is, is, is that it differs from place to place. But generally speaking, if you're 100% virtual somewhere, that's where that um, it's where your residence is that you will be um, you'll be paying taxes. Now, if you're spending say two months a year at the corporate headquarters, let's say for me, if I'm spending two months a year up in Montreal, uh, then 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 when I'm physically in Montreal, I may have to pay some Canadian or um, local city taxes for that. Um, but what I would do again is that uh, if that's the case, uh, what I would do is not only talk to your accountant. But um, companies that do this are very familiar with how, and they would probably be able to answer that question on a case-by-case -case basis for you. Absolutely. Well, that actually does officially uh, conclude the questions that have come in now, Eric. So I wanted to thank you on behalf of ProTech. Thank you again very, very much for taking your time today and to share your expertise and insight into what will prove to be a very um, interesting, interesting and exciting future for the IT workplace. Thank you and thank you for all for joining us and thank you for doing an awesome job producing today's webinar and for allowing me to do this through ProTech. It's an awesome company and I'm very proud to say I've been a partner of it for many years now. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you to our audience. Um, have a great rest of your day.